Yeah. And, and like in people taking personal, you know, personal responsibility for their health and really, um, you know, it's up to them to be as healthy as they can and live the life that they want, as opposed to being dependent upon someone else and having them or having them feel that they have the solution for them. Yeah. Oh, and, and it's a dangerous way to live. Yeah. Because then you're putting yourself in somebody's hands um, who may or may not have a vested interest in you. You know, th there are a lot of good doctors. I, I, there's a lot of good doctors. There are not some not so good ones. And there are ones that are frankly just burned out and will do whatever is the simplest thing to get people through their office. You know, when they're in a, an environment where they no longer have control over their practice or they're, you know, they have to see X number of patients or more because revenues keep going down, it's easier to run in and write a script for something than actually explain these things. To actually say, hey, you know, this drug may be appropriate for now for your high blood pressure, but if you lose 5, 10, I mean, literally, it can be as small as 5 to 10 pounds uh, or change your diet, you can actually have the same effect or greater than this pill would and you're actually treating the source rather than just patching up a symptom with it. Um, so it becomes incumbent upon the individual. Again, I'm probably a little bit more jaded from this because of my own market. You know, pain, the, our, our, the outcomes that we have in pain are just absolutely atrocious. And it's, it, it, and it's because, again, we're not addressing underlying factors. And, you know, you're talking about someone with shoulder pain actually finding the cause and maybe providing them some, um, you know, teaching them better movement or treating support. Uh, we'll just stick a needle in it. Right, and then we actually, oh well, well, we'll numb it up, and does absolutely nothing in in the long term. Uh, can actually create, you know, potential harm, lots of different potential harms with it, uh, and that's real common. It's very because it also happens to be very lucrative to stick needles into people. I will tell you from personal experience on that. You know, sticking needles uh, takes five minutes to do in a lot of cases, five ten minutes. Uh, spending forty five minutes to fifty minutes to explain to somebody why they don't need that needle is a very difficult and long conversation to have. Uh, you get paid. Oh God! Needle and uh, epidural and steroidal injections, which are one of the most common procedures in pain medicine, are anywhere from three hundred to twelve hundred dollars a pop. Uh, a forty-five minute um, visit in a clinic. Uh, I think I was getting paid about fifty bucks to do that after when I was at a medical group at the time. So there's there's a there's a huge and there's a financial incentive as well for some situations. Not everybody, you know, pain just happens to be a little bit dirtier than most other fields. Okay, so maybe we'll kind of move over uh, to, you know, what can people do about that? Like, how can people, you know, educate them better, but educate themselves better on, you know, if they really need that medication or, you know, if they're, you know, potentially kind of being drawn into this, um, you know, this farm, uh, this spider web of yeah. deceit. <laughs> yeah. How how can people like you know protect themselves or educate themselves? I would you know I would say most people probably listening to your show are at less less at risk, all right? Because if you look at the population, we have you know there's either well or unwell, and then there's the worried and unworried. And so you could either be worried and well and worried and unwell, or you could be unworried and well or unworried and unwell. The unworried people aren't going to go anyway. They're not really interested until something happens. Um, they're actually ones who are going to stay out of the harm because they're not going to go to the doctor if they're well. And if they are unwell, you know, generally something bad is going to happen to them. But it's the well that we, the worried people that we have to worry about. Now, the worried unwell should be seeing a doctor. The worried well, that becomes much harder because <laughs> you, you're almost looking at this external mode out. You're actually looking for something else that is wrong. You know, you're looking for, an, for I don't want to use the word excuse, but you're looking for almost a scapegoat. You're looking for something else that that uh, that is easier in some way. You know, you can say instead of having constipation because you're not eating high fiber foods, you can call it chronic idiopathic constipation. It becomes a label now. Um, so I would say for anybody who's really interested, you have to look at what the end game is. You know, what is it that you're trying to treat now? The and the reason I say that is if you're taking a medication and it's something like an antibiotic, you're taking it for a bacterial infection there is an endpoint on that therapy. You're taking it until the infection clears, okay. right? If someone is going to prescribe you a drug, you should say, how long am I going to be on this medication for? And if they say life, you should say, why? Is there nothing else? Now, in, you know, there, if you're taking, um, I'm trying to think of some, some lifelong disease where you actually need to take medications. There's some hormone diseases, some thyroid problems that you need to be on thyroid supplementation for. But most other things, you don't need to be on these other medications for life 
if you actually look at the risk factors that are there. Then you start going, well, okay, I'm going to take this medication if I need it now. But you'd always ask your doctor, what can I do for myself to treat these conditions that are causing this problem? So if it were, let's take binge eating disorder. Maybe someone actually goes in and they get diagnosed with binge eating disorder. And I'm not saying that you need a medication for binge eating disorder, by the way, I'm not at all. But say you just, your doctor recommends it and you're thinking it because you really are having a problem stuffing yourself every couple days. Um, you got to look at what else is what else is available. So things like actually addressing the issues, finding behavioral strategies that you can actually learn not to go into. Maybe avoid buffets or you know avoid these 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 ever. Um, I'm trying to think of things I would do. You know, eat, order appetizers rather than the full plate from whatever these restaurants that serve massive portions at a time. But look at the other things that you can do for yourself other things that can actually address those underlying issues and use the pill just as a crutch to carry you over until you no longer need it anymore. Right? The problem is that people, instead of using these things as a crutch, they use them as um, a walker or a wheelchair and they just stay in it for the rest of their life. They're stuck on these medications because they're not actually focused on addressing those underlying issues. So that's a long way to say, if your doctor recommends these, these pills, always ask them, what can I do for myself to treat the underlying condition that's causing this? But I also like the point that you said that, you know, mo you know, you should ask what the start point and end point is of the medication and there and majority of conditions you shouldn't have to take forever. No, no. And, and um, you know, one of the things about the Internet is, is a double edged sword. There's a lot of bad information out there, uh, but there is some decent information, too. You know, I, I look at things like. Um, uh, for whatever reason, I, I look into a lot of the the bowel problems, inflammatory ones like uh, inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel, etc. Now, the inflammatory ones, irritable bowel is intermittent diarrhea and constipation. It doesn't actually have any structural damage that's going on within the intestines. Now, if you look at inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease and things like ulcerative colitis, then there's there's inflammation. There's actually a chronic inflammation that goes on in there. They develop scar tissue within their bowels, etc., that can cause real harm. Those people are often recommended for steroids. And if you look at the standard medical literature, it says, well, there's no treatment for these autoimmune processes that are going on. Well, yes and no, but I have met more than one person now that has had Crohn's disease, an incurable condition, but through behavioral and lifestyle modification, got that to, the symptoms became so mild, they were no longer on medication. In fact, on my podcast, um, I had a, a guest that was recommended to have her colon cut out uh, said that if she didn't have the surgery done, she was going to die. Um, and she said, well, give me a month. And she started taking some aggressive steps and control of her own health. And she basically reversed the disease process. She's on no medications now. She has some symptoms at times. Okay, she does have some, but then she addressed those underlying issues and uh, lives a happy, healthy life. So, you know, we medical care is very, very good for horrible, awful things when you have them. Again, you're having a stroke, you're having a heart attack they're great for that. And there's going to be medications and interventions that need to be done. For, but for the chronic conditions, even ones when they tell you that there's, there's no cure, it's irreversible, there's nothing else can do, I would always, always advise people to look at behavioral and lifestyle changes they can do. You, you're not going to hurt yourself by diet unless you do something totally crazy. You're not going to hurt yourself by doing moderate amounts of exercise. And stress, which is um, another huge interest of mine, taking active steps in addressing stress, which is much more prominent and much more harmful than people realize, uh, will provide magnitudes of, of effect on your health. I mean, it's just, I call stress the fingers of God. It's like, or the evil fingers of God on you. Because if you don't address those, that's how it, it, you know, it just causes massive problems in your body when you're under these highly stressed uh, situations. Wow. And then, you know, are there any other resource? So we talked about the internet and the internet... It, it, I, I know you probably faced it. People, you know, search on the internet and they look at their symptoms and they see those symptoms and something mentioned on the internet and they come to come to see you and say, "I have this and I should be given this because it, this website says that." Now, are there like resources, good resources that you can recommend that people go to on the internet? I know with me, I go to PubMed. I do a lot of research when it comes to PubMed and that tends to be really good when it comes to orthopedic injuries. Uh, it is sciencey and researchy, but um, it's a great source to look at. Uh, is there any other sources that you can recommend people to go? Uh, <laughs> that's, that becomes very difficult. And, and um, if people are going to PubMed, 
you know, PubMed is, you know, for people who don't know, it's it's basically scientific research. You can you can search all sorts of things, and you're going to get scientific papers. Some of which are good, some of which are not so good. Uh, there are misleading studies as well, so you actually have to go through the, the you have to kind of dig through those to to figure out who's sponsoring it. Is it drug pharma sponsored? What's the you know what are they looking at? Um, how long was the study and such like that? But those are also written at a much higher level. We're talking most medical, even medical journals. Um, they're written at a 13th, 14th grade level. And if you look at the average consumer, uh, they communicate on about a 6th to 8th grade level. So there is a disconnect there. Um, and that, that, that's a good point. I, I'll tell you, that was one of my goals with my website at straightshothealth.com is to try to find, you know, to identify and provide some common sense, straightforward health tools and tips. Um, I mean, I'm always looking around, and it, and it, it is hard. It, it really is, because I'll find some websites that I that are okay, but then there, there aren't a lot of really good science-based websites. I guess that that's the that's the okay. okay. There's there's ones out there that'll say you know I got the magic cure for whatever, and it's this, um, but they don't have a lot of science to back it up. And you know, science too can also be used as double-edged sword, which we actually want to actually have some data and not just to have someone tell us that, oh, it's this thing and I found it in my garage, then that's the, the cure-all for your problem. You need to drink bee pollen or whatever the case may be. Um, man, I wish I had better I had better recommendations for you. I really, really, really do. Uh, God. I, okay. so yeah. There's a gap out there. There's a gap. So hopefully someone can fill it or you can fill it when it comes to... Yeah, yeah. I'm even. Like, well, I'm looking like Medscape and uh, MD Consult and things, and I guess they do have some. They do have some good. They, they do have some good information on there. You know, I, I think I'm just jaded because again, I come from the pain realm, and, and I look at the, their stuff on chronic pain and chronic back pain, even on MD Consult and and uh, and those websites, and they're actually those are not good. Those are actually wrong too. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure it's better for other things, but my is my interest is pain. My interest is stress, and and uh, I just have not found a lot of good stuff out there. Okay, and I mean, even you know, the qu one question I was going to ask was like, you know, like how would you end up approaching? Let's say you had one of these chronic conditions, and all these symptoms came up. Like, how would you approach it? And and you've kind of touched on it a number of times. I mean, your number one thing is you would look at like what are some lifestyle lifestyle changes and behavioral changes you can make to address those those symptoms and conditions before you start, you know, having some sort of, uh, medication or medical, uh, intervention. Yeah. I would guess I may be, I'm probably really weird when it comes to this. And I've been this way since I was in high school is I don't like doctors. In fact, I, I think that's probably one of the reasons I went to medical school. Um, cause I never liked the feeling of not knowing. And, um, but the other thing is I, I, and the way I look at things is I look at horrible, awful things. I go, what are we good at medical in medical care? You know, we have three therapies. We can cut you, poke you, or drug you, and they work really well for horrible, awful things or acute conditions, broken legs, strokes, heart attacks. And so if I'm having something that is worrisome, I would go to a doctor and say, tell me what I don't have. I, it's a different way you walk into the office. Not tell me what I have. That's a much huge, big, broad spectrum thing that is, is extraordinarily difficult to answer. But we can tell you what you don't have. You don't have cancer. You don't have an infection. You don't have some horrible, awful disease process going on. And in the absence of those, I don't really care because I know what the treatment is going to be. If it's not one of those horrible, awful things, I'm going to go back and I'm going to look at, well, Am I moving enough? Am I eating the right stuff? Am I taking active roles in stress? Those things are what I will treat chronic conditions with. Um, and so that's, that's just happens when we got away patient. I go, you go to a doctor, you want to find out what you don't have. It's like, again, if you fall, you, you uh, hit your arm with something really bad and it feels horrible, you go in there because you want to know if it's broken or not. If it's broken, you need a cast. If it is not broken, what are you going to do? You're going to, you know, you, you, be nice to that thing. You're going to take it easy for a little bit over time, but you're not going to have your arm chopped off and you're not going to have somebody, you know, you don't want to have a bunch of drugs just for your arm. It's going to heal over time as long as you don't keep, again, however that happened. If someone's hitting you with a baseball bat, you're going to say, I don't want to get hit with a baseball bat anymore and avoid that. Yeah. So go in and ask them what you don't have and focus on that. And yeah. if you yeah. rule out horrible, awful things, you're good to go. Yeah. I, I tell people that, Sometimes it's just good to go and have something, have it ruled out that there's nothing else, that there's nothing serious going on. Nothing serious. You know, some people that is missed, back pain is an example. Like it just, it's 
brutal and they can't do this and they can't do that and they think the worst case scenario and sometimes it's good to go to whoever the doctor or physical therapist or whatever and just have it ruled out that it's nothing serious and then when you have nothing ruled out it's nothing serious now it's time for you to get to work and work on it with, with a little caveat on there because then <laughs> again i don't know i don't know what it's like in canada but in here it, it's a hard time to get people we're always thinking about getting sued right so there's always this fear and we don't want to be able we like to be ambiguous because you know well, we can't decide whether it's serious or not. What does that actually mean? You know, what is somebody going to go back and say, it's, is this serious? I, so I would just go in and tell them, what, what, what don't I have? Um, and if they don't say it's this, this, and this, then that's good. There's a, you know, back pain, again, that's another one of my interests that I have, and I happen to be really hot on that topic, because uh, there are some risks with back pain, too. You know, if you people go in, I, I've heard that argument with MRIs. Well, just get an MRI and see if there's nothing serious. That's bad. You know, if you people who get early MRIs and back pain have worse outcomes, they have higher rates of surgery. It has nothing to do with the MRI findings. It actually, has everything to do with the MRI findings. Is people, you know, against the doctors will label that you have a bulging disc or a degenerative disc and say that's the source of your pain, which the data does not support, by the way. Um, but once you have that labeled, then you start fixating on that label. Oh, I got a bulging disc. I cut a disc, this, you know, a degenerative disc, and it's causing them all pain. You start noticing it more. You start putting your attention more towards that area, which actually increases this perception of pain. Um, and there's a whole catastrophic thing that goes with that. So I, I agree with you. I would say, but you want to know what you don't have. Um, Oh, man, it's a, it's a little bit more complex, I guess. I, I don't, I'm trying to keep it simple, but man, it just, it's just difficult. I guess everybody needs to go to medical school. You, then you can trust yourself and, and it'll be good. <laughs> okay. So we're kind of reaching the end of the interview. Do you have any last minute, you know, points that you want to leave people with? Or is there a question that I didn't ask you that you'd like to uh, answer? Uh, I, you know, I guess the big point, in what we've sort of hammered on over and over again is always look what you can do for yourself, right? What can you control and what you can't control, all right? Uh, the danger with a lot of medical care, the danger with these, these pills is they sort of encourage you to say, I don't have control over this. I have this you know, chronic idiopathic constipation and I need to take a pill with that. That's not, that's not true. Look at anything that you can do for yourself, for your health. You actually have better outcomes. You actually do better if you do get disease. Um, if you're addressing those lifestyle issues, you're going to be healthier and happier. And when you go to your doctor, as I said, you're, you're looking for things. What is it that they're going to treat you with? What time-limited things. So always look to what you can do for yourself. And when you're going to the doctor, you're ruling out horrible, awful things. And in the absence of those, always go back to behavioral lifestyle changes that promote good health. Which is never fun. You always want to blame someone else for the problem <laughs> instead of taking personal responsibility. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it, it may not be fun, um, but it's a much better life. Yeah. Like, yeah. Can, can you imagine, yeah. you know, being trapped? You, you can you can track yourself by allowing other people to control the decisions for you. And is is it an easier way? Sure, but it's not necessarily. It's not healthier. People aren't happier for sure. People don't do better. <laughs> people have you know higher rates of discontent. Uh, they just don't feel as well when they're not actively engaged in doing things for themselves. There's actually quite a bit of data on that. You know, people actually take control of their health, live better lives. Simple as that. It's true. It's true. And then I was going to say, what was the number one thing that people should get out of this interview? And I think you've, I think we've hammered it on uh, over and over again, like personal responsibility. <laughs> personal responsibility and, <laughs> and, and the four fundamentals of health. Move. Eat real foods, avoid toxic stuff, and that includes people, uh, and address stress. That's really, if you do that, and you, and it doesn't even have to be, diff, you know, you don't have to be running triathlons or anything. You don't even have to be, you know, crazy about your diet. Um, but if you do that, 80% of your problems are going to go away. Oh, that's a good point. Is it work, you just work on optimizing those four, and it'll take care of 80% of the problems. Yep. That's good. Oh, hey, Kevin, where can people get more information about you and, you know, highlight your podcast and highlight your uh, website? That'd be great. All right. So I do have a podcast where I, um, I talk about this stuff and rant and rave a little bit more. Uh, that's Straight Shot Health Talk. That's available on iTunes. And then the website itself is straightshothealth.com, uh, where you can find the episodes there, some other things here and there as, as time goes on. Yeah. Awesome. So thank you very much, Kevin, for your time. 
And thank you very much, Exercises for Injuries, readers, watchers, and viewers. Thank you very much for joining Kevin and I on, in, on this interview. Make sure to swing by exercisesforinjuries.com. Enter in your injury or pain. There's a good chance to have an article, video, or an interview that'll help you overcome your injury or pain. Secondly, if you're watching this on YouTube, head up above, hit subscribe. What that'll do is every couple days, you'll get a video or an interview like this where I talk about overcoming injury and pain. Thirdly, head down below, hit like, and leave myself or Kevin a question or comment. So this is Rick Cassell from exercisesforinjuries.com saying take care and bye-bye.